brunch. Happy Monday, everyone. You know, we always say happy Wednesday, happy Monday. I mean, I'm happy on Monday. I'm usually happy. I'm usually a happy person. I like to believe that I am. Yeah, but I mean, I, we love what we do, so yeah. Mondays don't bother me. No, me either. Except for when I have to go to the doctor and sit in the waiting room for an 8 a.m. appointment for 45 minutes, mm-hmm. and then that turns into two hours of my day for five minutes. <laughs> this is why I make appointments at 8 o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. because I want to be the first person yes. in... Without a wait. Apparently, there's people at like 7.55, 7.56, 7.57. Like, what is going on? There was like four or five people in front of us, and we were there on time. Especially children, with children. Like, as an adult, I can handle sitting in a waiting room for an hour. I have stuff I can do. I can read, whatever. Yeah, I I mean, I have other things I'd like to be doing. But like, but when there's children involved, you got to understand, like, they do not have patience at all. It is very difficult to keep children in a seated position for long periods of time. Like he's trying to get into all of the drawers. What's in here? What's in here? You know, what's this, mommy? What's yes. this? Um, yeah. So anyways, but yeah, generally, I mean, I love Mondays. I love Wednesdays. Wednesdays mm-hmm. always come way too fast. Um, I like the weeks just fly by. I know. We're recording this on Tuesday. It felt like it did not feel like Tuesday today. Maybe it's because Nick has been gone for two nights. And so it feels like it's been a whole week. <laughs> well, and Carson was sick. And Carson, poor Carson was sick. You feel so bad for him. Like, he really was not doing well. He was he was not himself. He's normally like nonstop energy, and he basically laid on the couch all day Saturday and most of the day Sunday. And he wanted to get up and play. And he he's so cute because he's like, I would take his temperature, and he's like, "Am I feeling better?" <laughs> and I was like, "I don't know, bud. Are you? Are you feeling? I mean, your temperature is getting better, but are you?" And, and then I was putting Taylor to bed, and I came downstairs. He goes, "I'm doing better. I took my temperature five times, and it told me that I was doing better." <laughs> Marcus is always like, I have a temperature. And I'm like, no, you don't. You don't have a temperature. Cause like when he is sick and you know, I always think he's hot. My husband's like, your temperature gauge is not great, but he'll be like, I, I have a temp. I have a headache. He's been starting to tell us lately, which I'm like, what? How do you know what a headache is? But he's just, fun. kids are smart, man. They are. They're so smart. They are so smart. Taylor's even like, she knows what she's doing. Yeah. She knows oh, very sure. clearly they know what how, she's She knows doing. how to push your buttons. Oh my gosh. This girl, my daughter is a psychopath, guys. Like, I love her to death, but good God. She is so stubborn. She is so opportunistic. And she just, she does what she needs to do to get what she wants. Yeah. She will. And she's into, you know, what's the tough phase right now? She's into wanting to go down and up the stairs chronically. Mm. But she can't go down and up. The, I mean, she can go up the stairs pretty safely, but like she cannot go down the stairs. And so she just wants to go. With my hand up and down the stairs, up and down the stairs. And then she gets really pissed when I stop and she throws herself on the ground. She puts her face on the ground and she hits the ground. And if I try to give her something, she throws it at Mm -hmm. me and like crumbles things. Well, and you guys have a unique situation with your Mm -hmm. stairs in the house too. So, um, yeah. I don't know, man. I'm telling you, the more that Marcus is getting older, I'm kind of like, maybe we're good with one. I'm not sure if I want to come back to this phase. But she's the best thing in the world. You know, of course. she loves, she, of she, course. Uh, she's in a big mama phase right now where she just, she pushes my husband away. She doesn't even want to go to him. I remember when Carson used to do that and you would get your hair I would feeling, get very you know, upset. Feeling, yeah. But. So I can sympathize. Okay, All right. guys. So let's dive in. So we are talking about leaky gut today. Um, we know that, guys, there are so many buzzwords and fad gut trends, I think, that are out there now. Probiotics are the best thing ever. Prebiotics, right? Uh. Take these foods, fermented tea, fermented blah, blah, blah. Uh, We're going to talk today because the gut is very complex. Uh, We're going to talk about top 10 things um, that drive leaky gut and the consequences of leaky gut. And we are also going to talk about the nuances of gut health because it's very complex. If you're not sick of you know, us yet, we're going to keep driving this home that This is not a recommendation for you. This is uh, very bio-individual, but these are general lifestyle things that can contribute to reducing the quality of the state of the gut. Yeah. We want to take complex scenarios and things and hopefully make them understandable. Like Mm -hmm. that is a big thing of what Liz and I try to do. So hopefully that's what we're doing (laughs) on the podcast. So if you want to kind of break gut health, into kind of two big things that dominate it. It comes down to your intestinal barrier or basically the lining of your gut and the gut microbiota, okay? Kind of like the makeup of the bacteria within the gut. So the balance, the good bacteria, the bad bacteria, the hopefully, you know, hopefully not, but like parasites, pathogens, fungus, yeast. You want some amounts of these things. It's important to have like small amounts of yeast. It's important to have small amounts of dysbiotic or harm, you know, bad bacteria. Um, 
But anyways, the lining of the gut is something very intricate and complex. So it is like multi-layered, made up of an intestinal epithelial cells, a protective mucosal layer, and immune cells. So the only thing is that that epithelial layer of cells is only one cell of layer thick. I'm sorry, one layer of cells thick. And that one layer of cells plus the mucosal layer essentially are your defense mechanism to keep the good guys in, keep the bad guys out. And it also prevents the passage of like non-nutritive things. So substances. So basically like the food you eat, you want to get nutrients from that food. So essentially these little things reach out beyond that epithelial layer into what's known as like the gut lumen, which is this mucosal, kind of like your digestive tract essentially. And it pulls nutrients into the gut and then it keeps things out like chemicals, toxins, or it should, you know, you don't want things like pathogens, bad bacteria, stuff like that getting in. And that single layer of cells protects us along with the mucosal layer. And those cells are kind of bound together by tight junctions of proteins that basically seal off the systemic circulation of the gut lumen. Okay. And that seal can actually be easily disturbed. It's quite delicate. And it can be disturbed by a lot of things, dietary, lifestyle-based things. We're going to dive into that today. And when that seal gets disturbed, the integrity of our gut lining is compromised and gaps start to open up, which allow molecules to escape from the gut lumen into systemic circulation. And now we have a problem because now there are things basically getting into our bloodstream that should not be getting into the bloodstream. And this is where a lot of times we'll talk about bacteria travels. It does not just stay in the gut as it should. And this is where a lot of times we'll see people have chronic yeast infections, bacterial vaginosis, UTIs, endometriosis, brain fog, all of these things on other parts of the body. And people don't think that their gut is the problem. It is very well possible that the gut is the root of that problem because you have opened up these cells that should remain pretty tightly junctioned together. And now bacteria, bad guys, are getting into systemic circulation and traveling throughout the body and basically creating inflammation and kind of wreaking havoc. Yeah. And, you know, this again is what we have said many times on this podcast, but uh, Hippocrates said it himself all diseases begin in the gut. So when you're having, you know, inflammatory, issues, uh, dysfunction, let's say autoimmune conditions too, Hashimoto's, Crohn's disease, things like that. You always want to look at what is the root cause of the inflammation? Is it certain food triggers that, um, you know, I'm consuming? Is it, you know, mold? Is it heavy metals? Is it medications? Am I deficient in things? So again, we're always looking at what's the root cause and asking the question, why, where does this stem from? Because inflammation is one thing we want to have good, um, you know, the ability to inflame and Deflame. We need to have that, uh, you know, acute inflammation. But when we become chronically inflamed, this is where we see a lot of, you know, um, things wreak havoc uh, on our health and, you know, just our ability to be productive and think clearly and whatnot. So that's one piece of the puzzle. And then we have our gut microbiota. Okay. And so this is really, really incredible. This is so fascinating. I will say, I love learning about all of the different, I always say like, uh, if you think about the gut microbiota or the, um, gut microbiome, you have good and you have bad guys, right? Uh, you have uh, good opportunistic, or sorry, you have good bacteria in the gut. I think of these as flowers and then you have opportunistic bacteria, uh, there. And I think of those as weeds. So you don't want to, you're always going to have weeds in your garden, but you don't want to have an overgrowth the weeds, right? You want to have a, a flower garden full of pretty beautiful flowers and keep those weeds at bay. You need both though, right? Because those weeds also have a purpose. And so what we are as humans is basically walking, breathing bacteria. Um, comparatively to our genetics, we are 150 times more bacteria than we are ourselves kind of crazy. Um, and our microbiome is what protects us in hundreds of ways, as long as that garden is healthy and it's balanced and it's beautiful. So you could also think of your gut microbiome kind of like an army. Um, and there are different layers and troops uh, in the army as well. So just think about, you know, here in the U.S., right, our armed forces, we have multiple uh, departments of defense. We also have uh, special ops, right? The same thing is happening in your gut uh, because when things are 
not functioning optimally, or there is something coming in such as a bacteria or a pathogen or a parasite that the body needs to defend itself from, there will be special troops that the army will call in uh, kind of as backup. And so that's one of the beautiful things about the GI map test is we can see not only what the departments of defense are doing, but also when we need to call in the special troops. Um, so it's just really cool because this is crucial to our health, our long-term health and longevity, as well as how we feel each and every day. And again, it's going to protect us if it is a, a good place from bacterial overgrowth. It's going to con protect us from detrimental toxins. It's going to help us detoxify things. It's going to protect us from pathogens, right? There's all kinds of things here, H. pylori, candida, um, you know, various parasites. But we want to make sure that we keep this good and balanced and that we have enough stomach acid as well uh, for our gut to be able to defend itself properly. And so what we will say here is you do not have to be symptomatic in order to have imbalances in the gut or to have leaky gut. Everybody has leaky gut to, to some extent, um, especially in the world that we live in today. So just because you're not constipated or bloated or gassy or your gas doesn't smell or you're not experiencing heartburn or acid reflux or you know diarrhea or soft stools, that does not mean that everything is pretty in the garden. And I'll be the first person to say this. I just got uh, my GI map uh, back and I'm not having any digestive symptoms. I don't feel bloated. My stools are regular, nice and formed. Maybe one day of the month around my cycle, do I kind of have you know estrogen messing with me a little bit digestively? But for the most part, I feel pretty darn good with my digestive system. And yet on my GI map, I popped up with H. pylori, candida, and a parasite. And then you know opportunistic bacteria that was overgrown and a little bit... Um, imbalances even with the the good bacteria. And so now it's a, a phase of healing to kill off some of these things and to rebalance. And so again, I just want to share that with you as listeners, just because you are not dealing with digestive distress or you know symptoms that are persistent or chronic does not mean that things are beautiful in your garden. Yep. So what can disrupt the gut? What drives it? What drives this leaky gut? A lot of things, guys. We're going to give you the list of top 10 that we kind of see, have seen research on, have come up with so that you can understand what are like the big heavy hitters that we need to be looking out for. So number one, gluten. And again, this is not for everyone. This is not every single person needs to completely remove gluten from their diet, cross-contaminated foods, corn, oats, all of those things. Here's the thing though. Gluten proteins are kind of the primary storage proteins, obviously, for wheat, barley, rye, and individuals especially who are diagnosed celiac or, you know, non-celiac gluten intolerant, it causes major inflammatory responses. And those people know that, you know, like it disrupts the healthy tissue structure of our gut lining, causes GI stress. It can either drive others, it can even drive other symptoms like rashes and asthma. And some people can consume small amounts of gluten and be fine. So we test for gluten sensitivity with um, the GI map. There's an anti-gliadin marker. Um, and so you can also obviously test yourself and do a gluten elimination and see if you feel better. And if you try to reintroduce it, if you feel worse, um, you can also do a Cyrex test. Those are great. There are wheat zoomers. Um, those are another great test that kind of individually checks all the different types of wheat because there are multiple different types of wheat. Um, but in general, gluten shouldn't be something you just like eat liberously. Is that a word? Liberously? I feel it is now. It is now. Um, it, which you shouldn't just be eating it a lot. Um, gluten triggers the gut inflammation by binding to certain recept receptors and promoting the release of something called zonulin. I talked earlier about those tight junctions of the cell walls that are important. So zonulin is a protein that basically drives the breakdown of those tight junctions between your gut lining epithelial cells. Those junctions should stay mostly closed, other than to obviously, like I mentioned, occasionally open to let nutrients in. With gluten, it can kind of open the floodgates, both in and out. So this increases gut inflammation and other systemic inflammation. Gluten also activates mast cells, which can drive histamine responses in individuals. So if you deal with allergies, if you deal with skin reactions, rashes, hives, stuff like that, um, gluten can be a part of this. So I would say if you are symptomatic, gluten probably needs to come out. And here's the thing. If you are symptomatic and you know that gluten is a player, it needs to completely come out. Unfortunately, gluten is one of those things that's not like all or nothing unless there are people that can tolerate it and know that they can tolerate it um, and keep an eye, obviously, on the health of things. You mean like you can't just remove gluten and then drink beer on the weekend? Like that doesn't work that no, way? No, no. Okay. Like, you know, you like the people that question magnesium and the safety of it, but then go and take antibiotics every week. 
Yeah. Um, Sorry, guys. <laughs> that was, I was triggered. <laughs> No, I mean, we do see a lot of people feel so much better Mm -hmm. um, when they are not uh, consuming gluten. And I will say, I've said this a few times on the podcast before, uh, I don't have the GI symptoms or allergies or skin issues the way that I used to. If I have gluten now, I experience joint pain. My back specifically hurts. It is wild. It doesn't have to be a lot of gluten, but you know, uh, let's say I had a couple small squares of pizza or something like that. Oh my God, we were at the uh, Monster Truck Show on Sunday and you guys, all they had was basically all fried foods, Mm -hmm. um, pizza, big ass pretzels, uh, water was like $6. So we snuck across the street to target, got a diet Dr. Pepper. And I was like, I'm just going to wait it out until we get home and eat when I get home because I love soft pretzels. Yeah, I do too. But I'm also like, I either I'm going to go home with a horrible stomach ache from this pretzel and or plus I'm doing the like gut healing protocol right now. So yeah. like, I don't want to bring all this stuff in, but, um, you guys, it can be other things too. That was my point there. It could be yeah. joint pain. It could be back pain. All right. Number two is industrial seed oils. We've talked about this at nauseum, I think on this podcast, but highly processed, refined oils, such as soybean oil, corn bean oil, rapeseed oil, canola oil, cottonseed oil, safflower seed oil. All of these represent basically an evolutionary mismatch between our omega-6 and our omega-3 ratios. Our body should be about a one-to-one or at least a five-to-one, six-to-three omega, six-to-three ratio. But what we see now is I've seen it as high in some research showing like 20 to one or 40 to one, Mm -hmm. I think I read um, not too long ago. And so what does this mean? When we have high levels of omega-6 pro-inflammatory, we need some of it, but we don't have a imbalance here that we have so much omega-6 driving so much inflammation and not enough to fight that inflammation, we don't feel great. Um, we This is honestly a root cause to a lot of uh, disease because it also creates oxidized inflammatory byproducts. So when we consume these, they induce inflammation where? In the gut. Um, and then again, this can just create an, an opportunity um, you know, for intestinal pathogens. And so the best thing that you can do for your own health and the health of your family and your kids is to get rid of all of these hydrogenated processed uh, oils, your butter substitutes, the margarine. Guys, I remember growing up with that. Can't believe it's not butter spray. When I did a Weight Watchers, we are going with anything that says zero next to the calories. I don't care what the label says. We are managing calories this way. Um, And so replace all of that. And this sounds so scary to people because they're like, wait, what you're telling me to eat? Butter, lard, ghee, all of these things, coconut oil, coconut cream that have uh, like a lot of calories and fats. And the answer is yes, because these are good, healthy fats. And also bring in things like salmon or fatty fish sources that you really like. I love... um, Oh my gosh, it's on the tip of my son. Sea bass. Mm-hmm. Sea bass is one of my absolute favorites. And just a fun fact for you, some of these things also have good vitamins and minerals. So when we look at grass-fed butter or we look at, you know, a tablespoon of lard, there's vitamin D, E, K. And so if you're somebody who's like, I want to feel amazing, start cooking with some of these things. Sure, you don't want to just start eating them like crazy, like some people do on keto where I just eat mountainfuls of bacon and all the burgers, right? We, we want to be smart with this, but start to read labels. Turn it around. Hashtag turn it around like we talked about on the episode with uh, the CEO of Malk. What is in the ingredients. I've done a couple of videos too showing, for example, like olive oil mayonnaise. You turn that uh, label around and what you see is that there's canola oil in there or there's soybean oil or corn oil. Start to really look for some of these um, oils in the foods that you're using and then make swaps. And I guarantee you, you are going to feel so much better. I can tell when I'm exposed to them now. Yeah. And just a little note too, avocado oil is a big one that we recommend, but there are only a couple of brands that sh- truly research has shown there are no other oils involved. And it literally might say 100% avocado oil and there are other oils included with it. So Chosen Foods is one the one that mm-hmm. I use the most. Um, I believe there's one other brand. I can't think of the name right now, but the, be careful with the types of avocado oil that you purchase because a lot of them get produced with other oils. Um, number three is food additives. So not so fun fact, nearly 60% of all of our food intake is loaded with food additives in the US. Most food additives have not undergone long-term safety studies. So actually many things go to market without proper testing. That is why same things with drugs guys, same things with, and we're going to talk about this in a second. Mm -hmm. That's why like 10 years down the line, if you've taken this drug in the past, you are eligible for this lawsuit. Like (laughs) What do you what do you think that we're going to see 20 years from now with a new drug that's coming on the market that's not even going through clinical human trials? Um, what do you think we're going to see? I think there's going to be too many people for a lawsuit, to be honest. Yeah. It's going to be most of the population. Anyways, 
food additive examples. Maltodextrin is a synthetic carbohydrate used as a thickener and preservative in processed foods. It actually enhances the adhesion of harmful bacteria to the intestinal cells and promotes biofilm formation. So biofilms are these things that kind of, they encompass colonies almost, or like big groups of bacteria. They build a fortress basically, basically. around. So for example, if you had candida growing in your gut, yep. these biofilms are going to come in and they're going to build a fortress to protect that candida from getting killed off. This is We're going to go on a rant about this in another podcast, but this is why for some people who've been diagnosed with candida, for example, and they take candida die off supplements, but they don't have biofilm disruptors or they don't have you know other supplements coming in with it, they actually don't do any good because those biofilms essentially protect that yeast from the ingredients mm -hmm. in some of these, let's say like Candida X, for uh, example, some of these herbal supplements or even antibiotics. By the way, guys, H. pylori, one of the reasons why it is so hard to treat with antibiotics is because these biofilms are resistant to antibiotics. For sure. And you need biofilms. They protect good bacteria too, mm -hmm. but yeah. you need to be careful because you don't want tons of them. Splenda stimulates the growth of infam inflammatory gut bacteria. Carrageen exacerbates IBD. Titanium dioxide is a whitening and brightening agent. By the way, a lot of like um, different products like bread and stuff like that is bleached with things like this that are mm -hmm. basically whitened. Um, it provokes salmon gets bleached because the color of farm raised salmon is like gray and it is not appealing to people. So it gets colored. Um, and so this provokes inflammatory cytokine responses within the gut. So this is the biggest thing with ha when you take supplementation to help heal the gut, you need to associate the food with it. Because if you are still consuming a lot of these foods and you're like, but I'm taking a probiotic and I'm taking, I'm even on a gut protocol, like, but I don't want to change my eating, but these supplements should help you guys. This could be canceling out a lot of the progress that you could be making. Yeah. All right. Number four. And before we talk about this, I want to just preference that number one, if you've had an emergency C-section or a C-section, I'm here with you. Um, so what we know is that what babies are exposed to as they come out of the birth canal definitely impacts the uh, their gut uh, microbiome. And, and the same thing happens, you know, when a mom is pregnant, that baby is feeding off of your gut microbiome, right? So there's some things here when you are preparing for pregnancy, like I am right now, um, wanting to change some things with, you know, what I saw on my GI map before I get pregnant. That's number one. And then number two is maintaining as much good as I possibly can throughout pregnancy. And then number three is really trying to do my best on the other side, because you know, like, for example, with Marcus, I had an emergency C-section to really get the baby what they need. Um, and so C-sections and then formula feeding uh, can impact their gut microbiome. We will tell you, we believe that fed is best. Um, both of us uh, had issues with, um, you know, breastfeeding me more than Becca, but at you know one point in time, both of us were using uh, formula because we had to. And so fed is best, but there are, um, you know, things that have a profound impact on infants and the development of their gut when they are not exposed to the mother's uh, vaginal canal um, and all of those beneficial microbes uh, within it. And then also we know that babies get exposed to all the medications medications, antibiotics that mothers get prior to C-sections um, via the placental circulation. We also would predispose our kids to things that we're taking when we are pregnant. This goes, it's vast and varied depending upon what you're taking when you're pregnant. Hopefully you're working with your doctor on that. But these things that we are taking that are not natural, even prescription medications can predispose children to gut inflammation, inflammatory diseases, and asthma. So when we look at formula, uh, for me, I did goat's milk formula. I shipped it in from another country um, because I wanted it to be very gentle uh, because formula can also be problematic for the little fragile infant guts of those babies, and it can promote inflammatory gut bacteria, increase the permeability of their gut. They are actually born with a leaky gut. They're little babies, right? They got a lot of work to do here in the world. Um, but on the contrary, Contrary, breastfeeding does increase the colonization of a guts uh, of an infant's gut with anti-inflammatory lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. So, if you're somebody who's been in this situation, what I tried to do when I wasn't perfect at it, I would do things a lot differently with the knowledge I have today compared to three years ago. But I did at times for Marcus, for example, when he was having to go on different antibiotics, I would give him an infant probiotic to try to help, you know, offset some of that stuff. And then when uh, the formula I chose what I felt was the best formula for him. Um, and you know, the best brand, which I believe was Cabrita, if I'm remembering correctly, that was the main one that we used, uh, for him. That was a goat's milk formula. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, you guys, again, this is like 
we're telling you the facts. This is not at all to make anyone feel bad. It is so hard in that period of life. Um, but that's just, that's what research shows. So number five, gut infections. These are things that we test for, obviously, with clients via the GI map. Um, so this can be things like bacterial overgrowth, viral infections, fungal infections, parasitic infections, pathogenic infections that can basically alter the composition of gut microbiota. And this creates a pro-inflammatory intestinal environment, and it can, also, it can also cause a more challenging situation to resolve. So Bad guys protect bad guys. If there is an overgrowth of bad bacteria going on, they are not going to, because our microbiome communicates to each other. Like they're constantly talking to each other. You guys, bacteria is so intelligent. It's been around for billions of years. It is fascinating. But if you have bad bacteria, they are not going to call on the immune system to come and get a parasite that they might see. So I, this is an analogy that I heard that really put it really well for me to understand in a better way too. So imagine you have a neighborhood and like there's a house that, you know, maybe they like make drugs in the house. So they aren't the best. Maybe they're not doing great things. And they see some suspicious activity going on in their front lawn. They're not going to call the cops because if the cops come, they might find that this bacteria is going on. They're making drugs in the house. And so that's what happens within the body. Bad protects bad. And so like same thing with heavy metals, same things with toxicity levels. These things basically protect you know, parasites and pathogens. And that's why a lot of times they don't show up symptomatically. They don't show up on testing because they know how to protect each other. And that's why when people go about DIYing their health with the gut or with detoxification, they can feel awful because you disrupt these things and you piss them off and then they become very symptomatic. So just to know when you have gut infections, bad protects bad. It can be really hard to get rid of them. And that's why you need to work with a practitioner. You need to work with someone that knows what they're doing. Um, and also things like food poisoning. So like a lot of times pathogens are very acute. So E. coli, salmonella, stuff like that. This is These usually trigger though gut inflammation down the line. And it can also stimulate like IBS um, through production of inflammatory antibodies. Well, and you have to think, so for somebody who's dealing with like E. coli or salmonella or another acute infection, sometimes they're having diarrhea and sometimes they're vomiting or mm -hmm. doing both at the same time, right? Imagine what that does to your esophagus as well. And so after something like that, you also want to calm things down, right? And bring mm -hmm. in some soothing and healing agents. Um, and by the way, I just have to share the story because you're talking about calling the cops on your, like, your neighbors and stuff. <laughs> so on Saturday, uh, we did a walk virtually for my mom in honor of her um, for the ALS walk. And there's a um, oh gosh, I'm totally blanking on the name. It's like a little, um, gazebo on the walking path. And Becca's very familiar with it. Cause she walks this walking path with me frequently. And so my husband and I and Marcus are walking and I'm like, oh, I think there's a man sleeping with bags in the gazebo. And so my husband like takes a picture, you know, he's like about to go get this guy, like a bag, a loaf of bread or something. Meanwhile, I'm over here, like Bolingbrook police district <laughs> calling the guy in. And so we get back to the house and there's, uh, like our neighbors are having some weird garden walk doing weird things that they do and I decided I was gonna chat with a practitioner friend and walk the neighborhood again and I see the cops and so then I'm nosy right I'm like what are they doing did they get this guy up what's he doing is he homeless did he have a, like a late night out so uh long story short I'm like I gotta go I'm gonna be over here spying on the cops and see what's going on with this so I ended up talking to the cops <laughs> and he's like yeah, so that guy had a really long night and uh, basically got lost on his way home, which I guess he lives like four or five blocks away in the next town over. And I'm like, it's 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning and it is hot AF out here. This guy must have really had a long night because he is just passed out in a gazebo in the middle of a wetland. <laughs> um, so anyways, I'm the person that calls the cops on. And I've done this actually twice and uh, the time that we've lived here because there was this car that was like playing really loud music. And we could tell that we think it's coming from a specific street. So yeah, I called them and it's never happened again. So maybe they took care of that too. But anyways, um, we're moving on here. I just had to share those random stories. Break up the science a little bit. So stress. Uh, and by the way, that causes me stress. Like when there's a guy passed out in the gazebo, one, is he dead? Two, like I have a three-year-old. Why is this happening? Right? It makes me stressed. Uh -huh, totally. But the human gut is acutely sensitive to chronic stress. I'm not sure that I know anybody even that really does a good job with counterbalancing stress that isn't in some way, shape or form chronically 
stress, like Mm -hmm. the way that their body feels living in this world, right? Psychological stress um, increases our intestinal permeability and allows for something called lipopolysaccharide, LPS, um, to enter the blood circulation. So that LPS is an inflammatory bacterial byproduct, okay? And that causes both local and systemic inflammation throughout uh, the body. And so one of the things too that I, I think about is from a food standpoint, with food sensitivities, when somebody is ingesting food, I want to bring this up because I think a lot of people don't recognize that you can have stress being added on to your system by even some of the best foods out there because you don't tolerate them very well right now. So there's you know a few different ways that the body responds, but when we have these mechanisms that you know happen, kind of these chain reactions where your body identifies, let's say. Greek yogurt um, as a non self pathogen. This is an invader that's coming in and it releases all of these other things like histamines or cytokines. That is going to create more inflammation in the body, not because it's a bad food, but because it's a food that is stressing your system out. And so it doesn't have to always be an emotional stress or you have kids Mm -hmm. or your job or all these things. It can actually be things that you are consuming each and every day, whether or not you feel it immediately or there's a delayed response, those things can be driving inflammation. So that's one thing that we also look at because when we're looking at leaky gut, this stress, psychological, environmental, emotional, food, um, all of that depletes the protective mucus layer in the GI tract and increases, again, that bacterial adhesion and penetration into the intestinal epithelial cells cells, um, and provokes that gut inflammation. So Something just to think about. If you feel like you've done it all, have you evaluated stress and have you evaluated like what foods are maybe stressing your system? Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of stress, another stress that can drive gut issues is overtraining and sedentary lifestyle. So moderate exercise is extremely beneficial for the gut. So moderate exercise boosts beneficial gut bacteria, including anti-inflammatory short chain fatty acid producing bacteria, thus inhibiting gut inflammation because you need something called butyrate is basically a major food source for your good microbiome. And so that is that short chain fatty acid. Your your body produces a bacteria that helps create that when you exercise. It boosts that beneficial bacteria. If you are sedentary, it is associated with increased infiltration and inflammatory molecules in the gut. Um, and so another thing to think about, you guys, there are muscles within our digestive tract that move food down your body into digestion, properly going to the bathroom, having regular bowel movements. If you are weak, those muscles are weak. And so you do not have as proper of transit and ability to move food through the GI tract. You need to make sure that your body is strong and capable. And although exercise is good, excessive exercise is not better. Um, I almost always see high-level athletes, CrossFit, like high-level CrossFitters have trashed guts all the time. So excessive physical activity increases intestinal permeability and negatively alters the gut microbiota. If you have chronic inflammatory illness or are under significant psychological stress, you'll want to limit strenuous exercise. This is why when we work with clients, we always put in protocols specifically for them, potentially temporarily removing high intensity exercise if someone's going through a healing protocol or if they're, you know, noticing that stress, I'm sorry, that High intensity exercise makes them more tired after the fact, things like that. Or you have loose stools every time you're about to work out. Like those are stressors that your body is not thriving with. And so sometimes you need to do like walking, yoga, things like that, um, because the high intensity can be really, really tough, especially on your immune system. It triggers the immune system and the immunoglobulins within the gut. Um, and we almost always see people that have a history of heavy training have really low immune systems within the gut, meaning like they're burned out. Mm -hmm. All right. Number eight is our circadian rhythm and sleep loss. So we've talked about circadian rhythm several times on this podcast, but it is not just your sleep. All of your organs are impacted by your circadian rhythm as they have their own circadian rhythm. Um, And so this in turn impacts your gut health as well as your inflammation. So when your circadian rhythm is disrupted by factors such as like you are watching TV late at night um, and you're not wearing blue light glasses, for example, so you have that exposure, Um, or you don't have a good sleep schedule and routine. It's so funny. I don't know how anybody doesn't go to bed before like 
11 o'clock at night because I struggle to stay up even past like 930. Like I don't I just, get as good sleep either. I love my, I love my nighttime wind down routine. Like mm-hmm. I do. And, um, I miss it when I don't have it, but, um, Related to your leaky gut and gut health, your circadian disruption has been found to promote, uh, again, the growth of inflammatory gut bacteria. So it decreases the beneficial microbes in the gut and it upregulates the intestinal permeability, aka when you're not sleeping, you are stressed, leading to leaky gut. Um, but this also impacts the LPS transport into the systemic circulation. So those lipopolysaccharides, as I mentioned earlier, and what we know from the research is that two nights of partial sleep deprivation. So not even total sleep deprivation, partial sleep deprivation induces changes in the gut microbiome, increasing pro-inflammatory bacteria and insufficient sleep exacerbates that gut inflammation, especially in those with IBD. So if you're somebody who struggles with digestive issues and you don't sleep well and you don't have a good circadian rhythm and you're not prioritizing your sleep routine, start prioritizing your sleep routine because it's way more than just being tired craving carbs the next day, feeling like, mm-hmm. I feel like you are, it's a horrible hangover when you uh, don't sleep well. And, you know, I get that you want to watch your Netflix and chill. By the way, the new SEAL team just started. It's so Ooh, good. I need to start watching that. Um, I get that you want to Netflix and chill or you want to, you know, hang out with your husband because that's your only alone time. Then you need to start saying no to some other things so that you can bump that time up or figure out a routine, um, you know, a schedule that's going to work for you to allow you to get that seven to eight hours of sleep that you need for health Mm -hmm. all right drugs guys and i'm not talking about like acid and stuff like that (laughs) (laughs) i'm sure that's not good for your gut either but here's what we need to talk about and i might get a little angry in this segment but like the frequency with which clinicians prescribe antibiotics is obscene especially when it's not necessarily determined that that is what you need like how many i don't go to the doctor very often but i remember i went a few weeks ago because i thought i had strep (laughs) which by the way was the most bizarre experience I've ever had in this doctor's office. But anyways, he was like, uh, I'm not really sure. I'll give you an antibiotic though. I'm like, so you're not sure if I have strep, but you're just going to hand me because they didn't test me. I don't know why they didn't test me. And in the moment, I think I was just so out of my own mind in what like the whole situation and and another story for another day. But like, I was just so beside myself with this experience at the doctor's office that I was not thinking clearly and they didn't test me. And he was like, but I'll give you an antibiotic anyways. And it's like, you're just handing them out like candy. And unfortunately, prescribing an antibiotics is the norm in our society. And the effects on the gut health tend to be kind of minimized because abundant research indicates that antibiotics have a long-term effect on the gut microbiota and induce gut inflammation. Antibiotics reduce the diversity and abundance of commensal gut bacteria, which allows for the overgrowth of inflammatory pathogens like C. diff, Clostridium difficile, and pathobionts such as Escherichia and Candida. These microbial changes can last for months or years after stopping the antibiotics, and the adverse effects are most pronounced in infants and young children. And unfortunately, with the prevalence, and you know, I want to do a little bit of more digging because I feel like there is a higher prevalence of ear infections lately, With and they happen more with boys, mm-hmm. but I feel like they're cr- everyone I talk to that has a boy is like chronic ear infections, chronic ear infections, antibiotic after antibiotic. And when they're young, we just talked about like there's a very critical time window in their gut microbiota de- uh, my- microbiota development. And antibiotic-resistant bacteria have been found to morph into more inflammatory versions of themselves upon exposure to antibiotics. That's why I hate this whole movement of like, hand sanitizer this, sterilize that, make this as clean as possible. Like we need bacteria in our life. And what we're doing is we're making this bacteria mutant. We're basically making it way stronger than it should be, which makes problems. And so not just antibiotics, things like PPIs used in the treatment of gastroesophy, I can't, GI, basically GERD, okay, acid reflux. I can't pronounce that word today. And they decrease stomach acid levels. We've done a whole series on this, guys. When the stomach produces sufficient acid, bacterial entry from the environment into the gut is limited. By inhibiting stomach acid production, these PPIs allow more bacteria to enter the digestive tract and proliferate in that small intestine, which can drive bacterial overgrowth, gut inflammation, and they also reduce the growth of that anti-inflammatory short-chain fatty acid-producing bacteria. 
they do a number on the gut for sure. And then SSI, SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, in other words, antidepressants, are known to cause constipation and appetite changes. Preclinical studies indicate that Prozac alters gut microbial community structure, increasing dysbiotic gut bacteria. And oral contraceptives also trigger gut inflammation. In fact, their use is associated with an increased risk of Crohn's disease, which is a subtype of IDD. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. We did a whole podcast series on birth control as well, talking about nutritional deficiencies, how it impacts um, you know, the gut microbiome. So you guys can go back and listen to that. Uh, one thing that I did want to say is, yeah, I've seen it a lot more too in terms of the boys. Lots of friends that I have, I think actually almost every friend that's very few, it's a handful or less of friends with little, um, you know, boys have had a lot of ear infections and double ear infections. And so listen, I was there, uh, Marcus had tubes. I think it was the best thing that we ever did because that took care of it all. Um, I know for some people they fall out, it didn't work for them or whatnot. And I can only speak from my uh, experience. Our doctor was so good. We had a long conversation um, after surgery about how antibiotics impact uh, the gut. And so he was able to give us, and again, this is more of a like a localized thing, give us antibiotics to put into his ears. Nice. Thank God we've never, um, we've only had to use that twice uh, in the last, what has it been? I don't know, a year and a half, almost two years actually. In October, it'll be, next month, it'll be two years. Um, and so that was such a blessing in disguise for us. And so again, if you're a mom out there and you're like, yeah, but I mean, I have to put my kid on mm -hmm. antibiotics because these things are no joke. A hundred percent. I would do the same thing. We had to do that a lot for Marcus. That was the only way we could get his fevers to stop spiking. Um, you know, and so if that's you just know, like you're not a bad mom because you are taking these things for them, but do your due diligence then try to help on the other side, rebuild that good gut bacteria. You know, we love Mary Ruth. She's got a lot of great products out there. Genexa, I try to do a lot of things with their ingredients for the kids just because then it's not as, um, you know, Ty children's Tylenol, there's a lot of things that have come out about the ingredients um, and things they can be linked to. I think that they can be, you know, correlations, but I don't think it's necessarily always causation. So it's just, what can you do to help alleviate the burden on these little guys' systems, um, you know, with processed foods and medication that we do need to give them. We're thankful for that medication for them. So I just wanted to caveat that because I know as a mom, it can be scary. And it's like, well, listen, Becca said I shouldn't use antibiotics. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that we need to understand the repercussions and maybe that's not always the first step that we go towards. The last thing here is environmental toxins. So Thousands upon thousands of new chemicals are developed every single year, various industries, right? Um, and in the United States, most of these chemicals do not undergo comprehensive safety testing before releasing them. That is just the facts. We are not here to debate one side or the other. Uh, we have seen it time and time again. Go on Instagram, follow just.ingredients. She has a fantastic uh, Instagram account and website all about some of these things that are allowed here that are not allowed in other countries. Um, and so do your due diligence to educate yourself on what are these products that you're taking? What are these medications that you're taking? Informed consent is basically what we're saying because gut inflammation is one of the most frequently cited consequences of exposure to environmental toxins. So BPAs found in your plastic water bottles, food containers, children's toys, I shared with Becca, I hope it came through. You never said anything about it. Um, I was watching a TikTok actually the other day and it was absolutely appalling. Some uh, guy was showing what's inside your child's plastic toy. So he had the giraffe, number one bestseller for, uh, mm -hmm. you know, teething. He cut it open full of mold inside. Oh my God. So gross. And I was like, I mean, this makes sense. And then they're chewing on that all day, right? Mm -hmm. That's scary. Uh, cash register receipts, right? All of these things promote gut inflammation by increasing harmful gut bacteria and again, leaky gut intestinal permeability. So do your due diligence. Um, I know that Carson had a meltdown the other day at the store because he couldn't have the receipt. That's fine. <laughs> Marcus does as well because they put a smiley face on it at Costco. But we're always touching these things as little as they possibly can and just toss it out. No thanks. Hey, anytime I get the opportunity for an e-receipt or no receipt, mm -hmm. no receipts. I, we were at Target and I try to explain to Carson that receipts are yucky and we don't want to touch them. And so I threw it away as soon as it printed out so he couldn't grab it. And he had a full on meltdown. Oh, yeah. And then every time receipts print out now, wherever, at Meyer, Target, wherever, he's like, don't say that it's yucky, mom. Don't say that it's yucky. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't with this child. Carson's my emotional child, I think. Um, okay, so what can be consequences of intestinal inflammation that I think a lot of people just do not correlate with 
leaky gut or with gut health at all in general. We, we isolate these things. And we're just going to run through these. Allergies, autoimmune diseases, arthritis, cardiovascular disease, GI disorders, IBS, IBD, diverticulitis, colorectal cancer, depression and anxiety, neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, neurodevelopment disease disorders, ADHD and ADD. Don't get me started. I think we might need to do a whole podcast on that. Osteoporosis, because leaky gut drives nutrient deficiencies. That's a big reason why a lot of these are problems. Skin conditions, the gut skin actus gut skin axis, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes and obesity, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because an accumulation of excess fat in the liver to people who don't consume alcohol is closely related to metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes and obesity, and a compromised gut microbiota appears to drive inflammation in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, whereas beneficial gut-targeted therapies like probiotics actually alleviate liver inflammation and dysfunction. So you need to understand that it is not just Alzheimer's. It is not just osteoporosis. It is not just that thing. It is driving from somewhere. The body is not meant to be dysfunctional. Yep. So if you have any of those things that we just talked about, allergies, asthma, I mean, again, just because you don't have GI distress or persistent symptoms, consider taking a deeper look at what's going on. If you are somebody too, who's on medications and your doctor keeps giving you more medications because things just aren't getting better. The certain antidepressant only work for so long. Now they want to increase my dose or I'm having side effects of this medication. Now they want to put me on another medication because of the side effects. Guys, take a deeper look at your health because while medication is absolutely supportive and absolutely beneficial in some situations for people, there's a lot that we can do naturally to help fix the dysfunction in the body and hopefully be more proactive rather than reactive so that you can thrive and feel good and be healthy every day. So if you guys liked this episode, please pay your dues, like it, share it, leave us a five-star rating and review. Don't forget, we are rounding out um, this month here very shortly, and you have until the end of September to give us that five-star rating and review and submit that entry for our September fall box, which has got some pumpkin things in it, Mm. Uh, maybe some non-toxic candles. I have no idea what all is going to be in there, but there's going to be some good things coming for our mystery box. Um, And so all you need to do to enter to win that is leave us a five-star rating and review, share this podcast, tag us, tag some friends, send it to people who need to hear this, and we will love you a long, long time.